I'm very much delighted and happy to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Sadashivan Shaji. He is currently a distinguished professor of mechanical and electrical engineering, Autonomous University of New Orleans in Mexico. His main focus is on nanomaterials by pulse laser ablation in liquid technique. Also, nanostructured thin films for optoelectronics and solar cells. Methods of synthesis are PLAL, CBD, spray deposition techniques. He has authored 172 international journal publications and also serves as evaluator of articles in index journals from Elsevier, Springer, IOP, ACS, AIP, RSC, and Wiley. On behalf of all the RIOS members, I welcome you, sir, to this webinar. And also welcome all the invited guests and participants to our eighth webinar. Now, I kindly request Professor Sadashun Shahji to start the presentation. Uh, buenos días, buenas tardes, buenas noches, gracias. Good evening, good morning, and thank you all for the invitation. A special thanks to Dr. Shankar Raman for the invitation to participate in this event. I'm so happy to see, of course, my professor, Professor Rajapan Nair sir is there, also Dr. Nikesh Nair, so many others, Dr. Shankar Raman. And let me start with my presentation to know. Uh, uh, to share some of the results I have with uh, uh, you all and the youngsters there to see whether uh, you, you will be interested in some, some of these things. So the title of my talk is Modified and Defect Switch Oxide Nanomaterials for Visible Light Applications. Myself, Sadashi Ben Shaji. I'm from <clears throat> Faculta de Ingeniería Mecánica Eléctrica, Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León, San Nicolás de los Garza, Mexico. So here uh, in my research work, we use pulse laser ablation in liquid, which is a, a simple technique where you can keep a target, whether it is metal, uh, semiconductor, or ceramic. You keep the target in a bowl or a, a glass beaker or in a coffee cup. You take a solvent or a solution like water or organic solvents. But you need a high power laser, a nanosecond laser, or a picosecond laser, or femtosecond laser. Focus the laser using a lens onto the target and do the ablation. And depending on the character or characteristics and properties of the target, you, make, you can do it in a very short time or a longer duration. We can get the nanoparticles dispersed in the colloid as the colloid. So the, the technique is very simple. While for, on the target where the laser is focused, we have a production of plasma, and this plasma expands while it is confined by the surrounding liquid. So the uh, closest layer of the liquid will form a vapor, so it starts the growth of a cavitation bubble, and the bubble expands and collapses, releasing the nanoparticles into the uh, solution there. So there are many advantages. You can avoid uh, the toxic reactants or surfactants we use in normal chemical synthesis. We can have pure uh, biological, even for biological use, you can get those nanoparticles in the pure solvents and directly use for different applications. And mm, I'm not going to too, too many details of that. You can use different type of targets. So the uh, properties of the nanoparticles you get depends on ablation parameters like laser fluence, laser wavelength, and uh, pulse duration. And of course, the properties of the liquid medium also affect the uh, morphology and particle size distribution. And there are, can be reactive ablation as well as non-reactive ablation. In the case of non-reactive ablation, you get the same phase composition as that of the target, like gold in water or uh, zinc in uh, dimethyl formamide or if it is reactive ablation we are going to get a new product for example titanium in water we get titanium dioxide or zinc in water you get zinc oxide uh, and if you use uh, tin sulfide uh, ablating in an organic solvent you get the uh, tin sulfide itself dispersed in the organic solvent like that and Varying this laser parameter as well as so different solvent, you can uh, change the morphology and size distribution of these nanoparticles. 
when it is reactive ablation, you have many more options. In the solvent also, you can have some uh, extra uh, uh, ions uh, to drop into the material. Uh, many, many uh, opportunities are there. It is actually a very short process where you can get Nanopart nanoparticles in the colloid even in one minute or less than five minutes. In some cases, you need to go for like 30 minutes or 25 minutes, depending on uh, how much power the laser has. And you can do it in different configuration, one like a vertical configuration as well as the horizontal configuration. Here there is an image which is showing that you can do it horizontally, keeping the target immersed like this, or it can be the vertical form. And we have synthesized uh, nanoparticles of metals, many ceramic materials, uh, semiconductors like tin sulfide, copper antimony sulfide, zinc oxide, titanium dioxide, cobalt oxide, as well as uh, bimetallic nanoparticles of silver gold and silver titanium. Also, uh, yeah, copper, indium, gallium, selenide, also we have synthesized nanoparticles of that, and different solvents we have used. So initially, I started with this kind of the synthesis process and later started to think about how we can convert these colloids to thin films so that we can use for many optoelectronic applications as well as uh, coatings, um, antibacterial coatings, uh, hard uh, mechanical properties, protective coatings, uh, including uh, uh, electrochemical applications. So once you have, uh, we can get good thin films using these colloids, there is a vast area for applications of these materials. So this is the actual photo of uh, the experiment set up in the lab where we use two YAG lasers, which are uh, now 10 nanosecond pulse width. And one uh, YAG laser has power of like 1000 millijoules for infrared and 500 400 to 500 millijoules for the 532, and you can get uh, other harmonics also using these uh, nonlinear crystals. And another uh, second laser, we have uh, 90 millijoules of energy, while it has tunable uh, pulse repetition frequency from 10 hertz to 100 hertz. The other one is fixed. And when you look for the theory behind the pulse laser ablation in liquid, you have the uh, focus laser energy where the plasma generation, which is confined by the, li the surrounding liquid, generation of the plasma, uh, sorry, cavitation bubble, the growth and collapse of the gravi uh, cavitation bubble and the release of the nanoparticles into the colloid. And there is a time sequence from nanosecond up to millisecond process in completing the formation of the nanoparticles. Another synthesis process using the same laser, what we do is, laser fragmentation as well as laser melting in liquid. <clears throat> I mostly focus on laser fragmentation, while in that itself, there is melting process also occurs. And there is a famous group in uh, Japan who completely focusing on laser melting, where smaller particles are melt into bigger particles, like 100 to 400 nanometer size range, very uh, nice uh, uniformly shaped particles, and they uh, use those particles for different applications. While I do mostly laser fragmentation, where we take the uh, micron size particle or bulk material, dispose in a solvent, and uh, irradiate it with the pulse laser. So there is laser fragmentation and melting, where you can get uh, different morphologies as of nanoparticles produced in the uh, generated in the uh, solvent. So there are two processes, either if the uh, laser is of picosecond or femtosecond, it's Coulomb explosion as well as photothermal mechanism, which the nanoparticles absorb the laser energy and uh, fragment it into uh, smaller size. And this is actually the, uh, the photo of the setup and uh, like a second show you the video of the ablation. This is a bimetallic nanoparticle target. 
it's a gold silver uh, target which we kept in water and uh, doing the ablation using 532 nanometer so you can see the color of the nano colloid is like greenish yeah we have synthesized the different nanoparticles metals uh, as well as uh, semiconductors and uh, all these uh, results are published into different journal articles and when we look for visible light applications, the first thing I started with is visible light photocatalysis. So since the semiconductors we can use for solar light absorption and do the uh, photocatalytic decay, we started with the uh, dye decay and now we are moving on to uh, different contaminants decay studies in the lab using solar simulator in the lab. So uh, different combinations of metal oxide as well as other semiconductor chalcogenides and all uh, semiconductor materials those are good in photocatalyst we are working on those materials one of the recent results which i um, got a, my student who which is a who's a she was a, a master student and did her master's thesis with me yeah, so basically she was a chemical engineer and did masters in material engineering and presented this work in uh, laser international conference on laser ablation liquid angel in france in 2018 and she presented the work as a poster where she converted white tao2 we know that titanium dioxide is one of the best photocatalysts while the solar light is not absorbed by the normal tao2 because of its wide band cap so it absorbs only uv which is less than four percentage of the entire solar light and if you can convert it to extend the absorption or change the band gap yeah you can have visible light absorption for that people have tried uh, doping making composites uh, incorporating metal nanoparticles and all but in this case we have we can say the light by inducing defects or self doping we could convert white TAO2 to completely black TAO2, visible light absorption, as well as uh, visible light photocatalyst. So during the conference, she presented the poster and the final day when they announced the prices, yeah, uh, she got the first prize in that conference. That was one of the proudest moments for me from a master's student getting the uh, first prize in the international conference. And later we published the article in Journal of Applied Surface Science. Yeah, here there is the it just I put them our article with the first article on uh, modified or black TAO2, which was reported by a group of scientists from uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab in UC Berkeley in 2011 in science, where they used uh, hydrogen uh, reduction or hydrogen plasma hydrogenation for hydrogenation at high temperature, uh, long duration to convert the white TAO2 to black TAO2. Well, in our case, we did it in the normal conditions, just radiating the uh, TiO2 powder dispersed in water for different times, 45 minutes to 90 minutes, and we got very stable. Still, we have those samples in the lab, stable black TiO2. Well, there are many different characterizations. The first characterization we have used was X-ray diffraction, and we can see that the uh, YTAO2 was a mixture of anatase and rutail, while anatase was the major phase and rutail was the minor phase. And as the irradiation time increased, we could observe a, a decrease in the anatase phase and an increase in the rutile phase. While uh, we have observed new peaks or in, change in the intensity of the peaks, as well as uh, broadening of the peaks in uh, peak width, that all leads to the uh, defects induced in the material. And one of the techniques we mm, was very helpful in identifying the uh, growth of these or introduction of defects in the material was Raman spectroscopy. So we analyzed the YTAO2 where it uh, identified the peaks of uh, anatase as well as rutile, and we can see the effects here because of the uh, induced defects. The peak intensities decreased. There was a broadening of the peak. FWHM of the peaks were increased. And uh, there was a, a blue shift in the peak uh, vibrational frequencies, as well as sometimes merging of two peaks, as well as broadening of the other peaks also. So, so all these were due to the defects induced in the material. So Raman spectroscopy was very useful in identifying these 
uh, phases as well as effect of the irradiation on these materials. Here we can see the uh, same images. On the top, you can see the YTAO2, which has uh, anatase and rutile phases. So we have uh, rectangular particles as well as spherical particles. And uh, different time of irradiation, we can see that the morphology is completely different. Some of the particles are like bigger than 500 nanometer, and very tiny particles also produce mostly spherical in shape. Here you can see that in 90 minutes, we have some uh, cracks or so changes in shapes of those spherical particles too, due to the effect of irradiation. Then we measured the uh, diffuse reflectance spectra of these uh, powders, where we can see the white one is completely transmitting the visible region, while the black one is totally different, and we have evaluated the band cap, and it is decreasing from uh, the white one was 3 EV which, and reduced to 1.8 EV. Then we use the X ray photoelectron spectroscopy uh, characterization to identify the elemental composition and their chemical states, and we observe that there is a shift in the peak binding energies uh, due to the effect of radi radiation, which was due to some hydrogenated titanium or Ti3 plus uh, states of titanium. And the uh, valence bad edges also showed a, a decrease in that case. So after that, that student went to, uh, she did a, uh, an exchange program in Germany. Uh, she was already learning German. And then uh, after winning that prize, they, she got off of a PhD in two, three countries. But she decided to work for some time and later do a PhD. Now she's working in Germany. Her plan is to work for two, three years and then continue for a PhD there. And recently, one student joined in my group, and we can we are continuing that work. Where here in this case, we have produced black TaO2 in different liquids. We use water, uh, isopropyl alcohol, as well as a mixture of water and alcohol. And in this case also, we have did the laser irradiation using the 532 nanometer, which is uh, lower photon energy than the uh, band gap of the YTAO2. And before irradiation and after 30 minutes of irradiation, this is the color of the colloid. And this is in water, this is in isopropyl alcohol, as well as mixture of water and alcohol. It's all, all the samples are in 60 minutes of irradiation. At the same way, we have characterized the uh, materials using X-ray diffraction where there was a change, phase change from anatase to root tail, while the most intensity changes are almost the same because uh, we use the same irradiation time. And here we can see the expanded uh, region of the X-ray diffraction, where there was a shift in the peaks as well as the uh, peak with broadening due to these irradiations. And uh, we have quantified the uh, phases using uh, read field analysis, where the white uh, WTO, the white one was uh, 60 percentage of anatase and 40 percentage of rutile, which is changed to uh, major rutile phase and minor anatase phase after irradiation. Here also, the uh, Raman analysis helped us a lot in confirming the phases present as well as the effect of radiation on these uh, phases and changes. Here also we can see that the peak broadening as well as merging of the peaks, peak shifts, all these were very useful in uh, identifying the effects of uh, in, uh, induced defects in these materials. While uh, something I have pointed out that where we have observed in our studies the maximum shift in the peak uh, energies as well as broadening or uh, changes in FWH on these peaks compared to all the other works reported for black TaO2 or uh, visible light absorbing TaO2. And here are the peak identifications, all those vibrational modes are identified and the peak shifts are identified and the uh, FWHM of those peaks are also uh, used for identifying the results. Then we, this time we did the transmission electron microscopy analysis also, and we can observe uh, different uh, changes in morphologies where we have uh, WTO, the white ones, HRTM and uh, electron diffraction, while uh, after the radiation in water, there is a uh, changes in the shape and sizes, while some of them have reported uh, an amorphous layer over the crystalline uh, particles. We don't, we see a very small amorphous layer, but not like in all particles. Uh, some of them have reported like even uh, kind of crystalline core and uh, uh, up to one 
two nanometer uh, amorphous shell. We don't observe that kind of effect in our studies. Most of them are crystalline, but this phase change is clear where we have observed the uh, particles with the uh, anatase as well as uh, rutile phases. And here it shows the uh, morphology by this is scanning electron microscopy in uh, pure, pure WTO and radiation in water as well as alcohol and in uh, water alcohol mixture. There was no big changes in the sizes or morphologies. Most of them were spherical in shape. Some were still with the initial morphologies too. So, um, but the major majority of the particles changed their morphologies due to radiation. And here also we confirmed the composition and chemical states by X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, where we didn't observe big changes or big effects of uh, Ti3 plus or hydrogenation. And only in one case, we have observed some titanium hydroxide, TiOH, because it was in water, some broadening of the peaks and the uh, balanced energies are, balanced bandages are confirmed. And you use the diffuse reflectance spectra to uh, identify the optical absorption and the evaluation of the optical band gap. In this, we have observed uh, 3 EV for the white and uh, to one uh, which reduced to 1.9 EV in water, uh, no, in pure alcohol. While water alcohol mixture was also close to that, 2 electron volt. And this time, we did uh, photocatalytic studies. So this is basically dye degradation, where we did the photocatalytic studies, repeated cycles to confirm that this, uh, thin yeah, this we did with the thin films. We first prepared the thin films using draft casting method on glass, and then we did the photocatalytic studies and repeatedly the cyclic studies using solar simulator. We can observe different uh, cycles where how the a dye decay and we evaluated the rate constants to show that these are stable and uh, uh, the modified or black TaO2 have higher photocatalytic decay than the white TaO2. Then we did the photoelectrochemical studies also this time uh, where the, for this uh, black TaO2 in different solvents we did uh, uh, cyclic voltammetry as well as uh, linear sieve voltammetry where we can see the linear sieve voltammetry in the uh, in the dark, and when we introduce the light, it stops out the higher current density for the uh, linear uh, voltammetry. Also, we did chronoamperometry to show the photo response of these thin films under dark and under illumination of light, where we have observed the hi highest photo current generation for the black TaO2 we generated in water, while the other ones were a little bit lower compared to that of. Uh, will be obtained in water. And, and we also did electrochemical impedance spectroscopy to see the electrochemical response of these thin films under dark as well as under light. And we have completed all those studies. And finally, evaluated the mod short key plots, which will help to identify whether it is an N type or P type material or what is the carrier concentration in each of them. And we can observe that all those uh, materials are almost uh, similar. Uh, kind of uh, uh, carrier density, while black TaO2 in water showed the maximum value. And similar to that, we did conversion of zinc oxide to modified zinc oxide or black zinc oxide. So zinc oxide also, you know, it has application as a transparent conducting oxide, uh, photocatalyst and all. So here we were focusing not on the transparent properties we were converting to make it light absorbing. So in the case of zinc oxide, didn't work in water because it was um, ending with um, zinc hydroxide. So when we change the uh, solvent to organic solvent, yeah, we could obtain the uh, black zinc oxide. So here you can see uh, four conditions where the irradiation time was 60 minutes is used as Z60 and 90 minutes as Z90. Then the drying process. If you are allowing to dry slow, it was getting into gray color. If you are using a, a, a heating to dry it very fast at 100 degrees Celsius, you are getting it much darker. So there was an effect due to that. Uh, drying process. So if you are keeping it open in the atmosphere, drying slowly, taking its own time, 
it was getting into gray while if you rapidly heat it and vaporize the solvent yeah you could get uh, really black zinc oxide so these are the morphological analysis this is the zinc oxide and it's at z60 while we can see that the rapid uh, drying we have slightly different morphologies and this is z90 as well as uh, when we dry it faster we have more spherical particles and these are the films after the uh, photocatalytic studies and here also we analyzed the x-ray diffraction where there was no peak shift no peak broadening nothing was uh, observed in that while there was a big change in raman spectra where the white uh, zinc oxide we had sharper uh, well defined peaks which were broadened and some of some of the peaks were uh, completely gone and the peaks were shifted due to the effect of defects induced in this zinc oxide and we analyzed in uh, transmission electron microscopy to see the morphology and crystalline nature all of them were crystalline there were no amorphous particles while these are the uh, white uh, zinc oxide before irradiation this is the morphology and uh, uh, electron diffraction while uh, after 90 minutes radiation there was a change in morphology and you can see that a uh, uh, rapid uh, uh, vaporization of the solvent the morphology was slightly different and we observe a little bit lesser crystallinity compared to the other ones but still in xrd it, and it showed a very good crystallinity and in this case xps was very helpful to confirm the effect of defect induced in the zinc oxide you can see here uh, um, the peaks of zinc there was no changes in, changes in their chemical states while in the case of oxygen yeah z60 cd60 and you can see that in 90 minutes it has a higher concentration of the adsorbed oxygen and that's how many others also reported that when you have more uh, defects induced you can have higher concentration of the active oxygen adsorbed on the surface and here we can see the zd90 got a very high concentration of the oxygen adsorbed on that and naturally every, everyone will feel that yeah you did irradiation in organic solvent what about the carbon is that giving a carbon layer or there is carbon coated or what happened is in in this case to end up with the black particles yeah we did the analysis of the carbon peak in xps here we can see that in the uh, before radiation we had the highest concentration of uh, carbon on that and those ones after radiation in the organic solvents they did, they are actually have lesser carbon content than the white zinc oxide and we evaluated the valence band interest too we use diffuse reflection spectroscopy for the powder uh, uh, optical properties we can see this is how the white zinc oxide and all the irradiated uh, zinc oxide had uh, higher absorption in the visible region which led to a change in band gap from 3.2 to 2.8 electron volts by the tau plot and here we can uh, we did the photocatalytic decay of dye where it was mm, uh, less stable or the cyclic efficiency was decreasing rapidly for the uh, uh, samples while when we annealed those films and repeated the photocatalytic activity even the cyclic activity there was very good performance for the dye tk so this is a 90 minutes uh, irradiation film without annealing and the same film after annealing then another material we have used in the lab is cobalt oxide CO2 3 and a composite of zinc oxide with cobalt oxide. So, cobalt oxide is black in color itself, and after laser fragmentation, yeah, the size decreases, the optical properties changes, so it changes to uh, yellowish in color. So, these films were first irradiated in water, and uh, yeah, it is water. So, spraying this colloid, you got a thin film. And we did all characterization of this uh, uh, SAM, TEM, and uh, XPS, uh, scanning electron microscopy. This is the film morphology as as prepared and uh, annealed at 150 degrees, 300 degrees Celsius. That helped to make the films more compact. And these films, 
we did uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy analysis, as well as we did uh, uh, mapping of different elements and its chemical state. So there is an option for XPS mapping. You can select an area and go for uh, identifying different peaks and integrate the intensities to get the mapping in XPS, which was also useful to show the presence of active oxygen higher in the 300 degree annealed samples. And the optical uh, properties were evaluated by the absorption spectra. And we tried visible light photocatalysts using the same films, and we could observe that the 300 degree annealed cobalt oxide films were uh, more efficient in the photocatalytic decay of dye. And in that case, all these cases we have did, uh, done uh, repeated cycles to show that those are stable and uh, very good in photocatalytic activities. In another work, we made the composite while zinc oxide was uh, mixed with uh, uh, different percentage of 10% uh, of cobalt oxide, 12.5% and 20% of cobalt oxide. And first we did a cryo milling. So it's a milling under uh, liquid nitrogen te temperature. We did a cryo milling to reduce the particle size while uh, the presence of or the maintaining the temperature at uh, liquid nitrogen will help to uh, 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 have the uniformity and uh, uh, in the, inducing some effect on the particle morphology. And we dispersed, these are the mixed powders after cryo milling, and dispersed in uh, water and did laser irradiation. We can see that the black color, it is changed to green in color. So the nanocomposite we observed is green in color, and those were in the morphology wise, in the TEM, we could observe that those were like nano flakes of zinc oxide, cobalt oxide composite. So these are the, this is the morphology of zinc oxide. This is the morphology of cobalt oxide before uh, uh, cryo milling. This is the morphology of the cryo mill samples. Then after uh, laser fragmentation, laser radiation, we obtained these films with the morphology changes, and we analyzed in TEM and, and HR TEM. And in this technique, also, in this study also, we used XPS to identify the uh, chemical states of zinc, cobalt, and oxygen. When we have uh, these ones, uh, we analyze the precursor materials also, as well as the nanocomposite, and confirmed all the chemical states and compositions. Then we tried the uh, visible light photocatalyst, and we can see that in all the cases of these uh, composites, they showed st highly stable and uh, uh, repetition for the cyclic photocatalytic, this was also methylene blue dye decay, where uh, the 20% showed the best efficiencies as we have seen in these charts. In another work, yeah, uh, we used uh, bimetallic nanoparticles to combine with zinc oxide to form the hybrid nanomaterials. So we have done nanoparticles of metals. And in this case, we used a 50-50 weight percent the target of gold and silver. And ablation of the target lead in water was getting, leading to the synthesis of bimetallic nanoparticles, where, of course, there are results that to show that when we have gold, the color is like a, a purple, and the optical, the Plasmon resonance was around 525 nanometer. When it was silver alone, it was around 400 nanometer for the silver nanoparticles. And these ones had plasmon resonance between 450 to 470 nanometers. And the color was green. So we did ablation for two minutes, five minutes, and 10 minutes for the bimetallic target. And the nanoparticles were also characterized and mixed with the zinc oxide as a fixed amount of zinc oxide. And after laser irradiation, we got a color change to these kind of orange and uh, red colors. So when we had a higher concentration of bimetallic particles, it was much darker in color. And with lower concentration, it was much uh, like orange in color. And these films, this is a complete process. We had a bimetallic colloid. You can see the color of the colloid and mixed with zinc oxide. Laser irradiation, this is the powder, final powder we have obtained. So there is a laser fragmentation and uh, melting of these particles to result with the hybrids. So, so here, here are the same images of so the, the morphology of the uh, gold-silver 
by two minutes ablation, five minutes ablation, and uh, 10 minutes ablation. So you can see that in the 10 minutes ablation, more spherical particles are present. And these ones were, of course, analyzed in XRD to, to confirm the uh, crystalline structure. So this always show the because of the very low percentage of uh, metal uh, by metallic nanoparticles, there was no detection in that. The ma main peaks of zinc oxide is, is identified. And of course, these ones also, we did the XPS to confirm, ADAX to confirm the presence of all these by metallic nanoparticles. And we did the visible light photocatalyst of studies of these materials too. And the photocatalyst results showed that uh, 10 per, uh, ablation of Nanoparticles we have obtained for 10 minutes ablation showed the maximum efficiencies and those were really stable and for the repeated cycles. And the main conclusions for you, I think you have seen that all the colors. We started white, we had black, we had green, orange, red, uh, yellow. Okay, so using this simple techniques we could obtain defects induced as well as hybrid nanomaterials using uh, pulse laser ablation as well as laser irradiation in liquid where these ones were good for photocatalysis as well as photoelectrocatalysis and the photoelectrocatalysis we did uh, uh, hydrogen evolution oxygen evolution studies or uh, also now we are focusing on water splitting studies too and all these were um, modified their morphologies and uh, optical properties and which is a simple and easy synthesis technique in uh, generating nanostructured materials for of course applications in energy sensing catalysis biomaterials coatings etc and some of the research projects going on in our lab mainly nanostructured thin films for solar cells yeah so we our group is focusing on thin film solar cells also for chalcogenides and the perovskite materials and uh, many hybrids too. And um, here you have seen we use different nanomaterials for visible light photocatalysis as well as photoelectrocatalysis. And one of the currently running project, uh, uh, which is bimetallic nanoparticles and their protective coatings on their co uh, coating. So since these are in nanocolloids, we can use different techniques for the film fabrication. So you can use uh, spin coating, you can do spray deposition, you can do drop casting. And in the case of bimetallic nanoparticles, we use electrophoretic deposition. So in that case, you use the colloid and you you, uh, you keep the electrodes, apply, the, apply a voltage. So since this is in a colloidal form, the shape of the substrate won't affect much. You can have it on spherical substrate or when you go for spray and all, it has to be always uh, plain substrate. So in this case, that's the advantage. You can get coated it on the road. So, so it has many advantages. You can have antibacterial coating, protective coating. Uh, for example, this bimetallic gold silver, it has a green color totally different from the normal green. So it can, and now we are studying the mechanical properties of those films also, as well as the corrosion properties of those films. Yeah, you can have uh, one day your phone cover coated with that kind of color. So, so uh, one of the advantages of that, and as well as when we did silver uh, titanium and we coated it on some metal pieces, which they use to fabricate the surgical devices. So you can have it on that very hard coating at the same time silver as well as titanium with a small layer of oxygen form titanium dioxide form both are uh, having antibacterial properties plus wear protection and another area we focus on in in the lab is extending the absorption of uh, semiconductor nanocomposites to have uv visible near infrared photodetectors you know that it's a Visible CCD, yeah, it's very economic, but as the detection to near infrared extends, it's the prices get doubled, tripled. So, so far we have up to 1064 nanometer uh, detection. Now we're waiting for some more wavelengths to see, uh, come modifying these materials to have extended visible light absorption. So from purely visible light absorption, we could extend it up to near infrared detection in photo detection. 
and for the, some of the co one student came from France for summer research and he did some solar nanofluids and the photothermal studies too. And one master's student did uh, glucose sensing using uh, metallic plasmonic nanoparticles. And uh, now one doctoral student is focusing on nanocomposites for hydrogen evolution and oxygen evolution reactions. And all these things, of course, through a lot of funding from the, the National Council for Science and Technology in Mexico. These are the main three projects I got so far. First one was the uh, Young Scientist funding, which will help me to buy the uh, high power laser and optical table and power meter and set up my lab. And the second one was for the uh, extension of storage life for fruits and vegetables using uh, antibacterial activities of silver nanoparticles. That was one of the project, which was helped, which helped was in collaboration with the biology department. They helped me in the, all those studies. My my role was to synthesize and characterize the nanoparticles and hand over the colloid to them. They did all those studies, and we had a, a successful project with that. And the latest one is as a professor, like a senior professor project, which is based on bimetallic nanoparticle synthesis and their coatings for protective and minor projects from university as well as another funding agency in mexico of course thankful to the department my our research center two of our research centers one on material science and technology another on aeronautical engineering and many collaborators uh, all over the world so many people uh, motivated me uh, sometimes i send my students to their lab and majority of these studies all done in my lab only my students when they go for to other lab they participate in their own project the a visitor the uh, the university there and help them in some of their projects nothing re related to their uh, phds or master's thesis they participate in the visiting institutions project so that there is no uh, uh, Robert, um, the right on property issues or anything because we have all, all the research facilities here in there this is the group right now and some of them uh, the previous members are graduated and uh, two of them are in germany doing postdoc another in uk doing the postdoc one person in uh, mexico city doing the postdoc other uh, others are working in different institutions there are uh, one, my first PhD student is a faculty in our department itself. Another two of them are in national labs in Mexico. So we are very happy to uh, have collaborations with them. And of course, they were the main support for me. And here in at present in our group, we are three professors. Dr. Bindu Krishnan, she's the one who is focusing on solar cell materials. Dr. David Avajaneda, he's the one uh, working on tin sulfide and related uh, semiconductor materials for solar cells and optoelectronics, myself. And this is Albert Paul, you know, he's from Kerala, from Cochin. Uh, he's uh, a doctoral student of Dr. David. And uh, uh, this is Pooja, uh, Pooja Revington Nair, she's from Trivandrum. She's the one who's doing the Black to EO2 and uh, photoelectrochemical studies. Uh, Dr. Claudia, she's a postdoc, not my postdoc, not in a, actually she's a postdoc of one of my colleagues in physics department. Since I have the electrochemical characterization studies, she's working in our group now. Uh, Katia, she was the master student of mine, and now she's working with Dr. Bindu for uh, PhD. Uh, Aishwarya, Aishwarya is from Wadagara. So she's also doing uh, thin film solar cells with uh, Dr. Bindu. Uh, this is uh, Angela. Angela is an undergraduate student. Now she's in fourth semester of uh, engineering. She's my research assistant. Uh, two years ago, I was promoted to one of the uh, uh, third level of researchers, the highest level of researchers in Mexico so that I, I get an extra fellowship, plus I can support a student. The, the National Council of Science and Technology will pay the student fellowship. So she's selected, and she's the one who is working as a research assistant at, with me. And this is Washika. Washika is from Palakkad. She's doing PhD with uh, Dr. Bindu. This is Mr. Paolo Suti. He, he's also from Cochin. 
uh, doing PhD with uh, Dr. Bindu. Uh, this is uh, Mr. Joseph. He's from Honduras. He did master's with me. Now he's completing his PhD with me. He's the one who's working with the bimetallic nanoparticle synthesis and their coatings. This is Mr. Sabin Divas here. Sabin is also from Cortem, Wycombe. Uh, he did master's in NIT and now he's completing his PhD. So uh, Aishwadi and Sabin are finishing the PhD by uh, March of next year. And this is our group. So of course we ha have a uh, Facebook page. Sometimes we share the articles there and when students graduate their photos and all. Thank you all. Gracias. Namaste.